Yes, I'm Kevin Ryan, State Representative from the 139th District, representing Basra, Montville, and Norwich. I have been serving for 13 terms. Uh, I have been serving on the Appropriations, Public Health, and, and this currently the Environment Committee, uh, dealing with the issues uh, that especially you know affect my region. With environment, we're kind of concerned about the agricultural industry in the state, since it was such a vital part of uh, the industry in southeastern Connecticut in certain aspects. Um, and uh, my issues that I have been looking at are going to be the jobs in the economy, uh, education, and uh, access to affordable health care. Um, why would that experience, uh, are you not in a higher leader, leadership position? Is that a, a, a strategy adopted by you? You, you know, so, some of that many terms you might think I'm a deputy that. speaker, which, which is pretty much about as high as you can go unless you're the speaker yourself. So. Okay. And I have served as a committee chair, and I have I'm currently I'm ser well, I was serving as a chair of a subcommittee in appropriations as well. And I've chaired a more commission, and I actually uh, did a lot of work in the last session with bringing a conference into the state, uh, a, a national conference uh, into the state of Connecticut that gave us, uh, you know, the economic values of that. In addition to the fact that I just saw that two of the people that helped us with that are getting an award from the uh, Hartford Tourism Group for the work that they did with that particular conference. So, uh, uh, To remind people, the Moore Commission, uh, uh, what, what that stood for, what you know, its goals were, and ha did you, have you seen any fruit of that, that effort? To, uh... Yeah, the Moore Commission was an effort to m really increase the efforts on regionalization. Um, and uh, we did, I think we did, on my particular committee dealt with regionalization. Uh, we looked at basically schools. Uh, we looked at, and we did come up with a common school calendar, which we thought would be effective in uh, cutting costs. We looked at issues such as bus transportation and uh, food services, things of that nature that we thought districts could share and kind of lower their costs if possible in those regions. And IT was another big issue we looked at uh, that we thought could be effective. Uh, some bills were proposed because um, since we weren't a <clears throat> true committee, we had to refer the bills to a committee that could then bring it to the floor. And a school calendar bill did get through. Some efforts were made on the other aspects, <clears throat> but that kind of, uh, I don't think they were as successful. Um, uh, Connecticut's, you know, it's called the land of steady habits. Mm -hmm. uh, home rule is, is sacrosanct. Uh, do you think with the economic realities the state is facing, uh, the, the deficits it continues to confront, um, any likelihood that some of these ideas could be revisited, that there might be uh, some movement on, on approaching some regionalization efficiencies? I think we keep on talking about it, and I think we've always tried a carrot and a stick approach. And like you said, there's, an, there's a real effort towards home rule. People are afraid to give up any kind of power or authority they may have over issues. Uh, but I think we're getting to a point where we might have to be a little more stringent in what we recommend. I mean, for example, when we had the budget issues during the last session, two of the local towns, uh, smaller towns, were going to consolidate their education systems uh, when they didn't think they were going to have the money to be able to write to run each school system individually. And that was a real big step in the right direction. But as soon as the money came back, the idea was dropped. So um, we might have to look at trying to really make um, a, a real effort. I mean, for example, we do a lot right now with the um, with East Con and the regional learning centers, and I think we're going to have to, or the rest, I'm sorry, and we're going to have to probably see what we can do more with them and make more efforts. I mean, they've done a lot of good things. Like, I think the rest has, uh, has, has kind of come along with a way of sharing the costs of uh, power in the school systems, electricity in the school system. We're just going to have to probably make more effort to make them do more uh, in that way of regionalization. They just seem to be afraid to do it. Towns, people just don't want to give up that authority. They want to have, be able to have that control, but they can still contain the control, but still share some of it, I think, with the reason, especially if it saves them money. Um, uh, could you respond to uh, the uh, uh, criticism by your opponent that, that 13 terms are long enough, that uh, uh, if the state has had uh, issues with uh, fiscal problems, that someone who's been there as long as you have has ownership of those, and uh, for no other reason, it's, it's time for a change, just to give new blood, give new ideas a chance, as opposed to returning some of the offices you, as long as you have. Like the, you know, here response to that sort of basic argument that uh, you know, you've had enough time. Uh, well, see. I think that experience has helped us th through the difficult times that we've just seen uh, with this downturn in the economy. We were able to sit there and see what we've done in the past and not make the same mistakes again. 
Uh, we we did go through a period where we had to do a couple of tough, tough budgets. We were ready to do that, did that. And that led us to this last session where we came up with two bipartisan budgets that everybody worked out and I think is a little more sustainable. Um, so I think that experience helped get through that uh, tough part. Um, as far as my, I don't know experience my opponents had. I mean, he's only been in the area about a year and I don't think he's got any any experience in the region on any of these issues. So I don't know what he would have done differently or what he would have brought to the table in those regions, those issues. And what drives you to, con to continue, continue running? Um, I think the fact that, you know, um, you, you can do a lot of good. I mean, especially with constituent work, you can help a lot of people and that's kind of uh, rewarding in and of itself. And you see what the overall effect is. I've done a couple of bills that have helped uh, children with medical issues, which have kind of uh, been appreciated. First of all, the testing for cytomegalovirus, and then more recently when we did the bill to allow children to be able to use uh, medical marijuana to help, for example, with uh, epileptic fits uh, at the request of a mother who, was <clears throat> who had actually moved to Maine to be able to give her daughter uh, this type of care and that she found to be pretty effective. So, I mean, it's things like that that really help you keep on going, plus the general things of just, you know, overall providing education working with the healthcare industry to help provide more health care to the, to, to the people in the regions, which is also important. Uh, now, I think you, you stated uh, economy and job growth mm -hmm. being one of your priorities. What, I think it's everybody's priority, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know it, 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 it was the top issue yeah, yeah. in the recent Quinnipiac poll. Mm -hmm. um, what can the state do differently or additionally uh, in that regard? I, th I think, you know, um, we've looked, uh, this region we've gotten, we've got kind of mixed results where we see the ca casino declining in the number of jobs they have, which has had an adverse effect. Uh, we've made an effort to try to uh, help put that off a wee bit with the possible opening of a third facility, which would transfer some of the jobs there. But in this region, we've also been lucky because EB is going to be increasing the number of jobs, and we've got to work to ensure that the kind of people that they need are trained to do the kind of jobs that they have. And we've also looked at the fact that there seem to be a lot of manufacturing jobs in the region that need trained people, and we've made a real effort to uh, make that training available to them at the uh, technical schools as well as the community college so, we can, so people can have those jobs. And I know people talk a lot about the fact that um, people are leaving the state, but I, one of the groups that are coming back into the state are the um, millennials who are um, educated and have these kind of jobs and we see older people moving from the state uh, and a decline because of the birth rate I guess of younger people but that middle group they're coming back to the state for jobs for places like EB I think you've seen even in London here you've seen a lot of these folks who have moved back or moved back or moved to the region to hold these kind of jobs so that's what I want to make sure and with our educational facilities make sure that our young people are prepared to take jobs and, and uh, even come up, as, there's a lot of incubators at UConn that we've visited, that they're devising new jobs, new industries that could uh, be an economic boom for Eastern Connecticut in the STEM area. Mary, you want Yeah, you mentioned to me on the phone that you were looking to work with um, some of the high schools and the community college in Norwich to um, look at programs that would help train mm -hmm. people for these manufacturing jobs at right. UB. Um, can you explain that a little well, bit? Well, we, we were on a, I was on a, well, attended meetings that were a committee, for example, at Montville High that was trying to develop a track uh, for manufacturing uh, to kind of train young people to go into the manufacturing field. They weren't able to actually uh, culminate with the kind of program they wanted, mm -hmm. but they do have some educational tracks within the system that help young people be able to go into that, mm -hmm. uh, kind of gear their education to that field so that, that once they leave high school, they can probably go to a community college and kind of continue to work in that arena. Mm -hmm. So again, manufacturing's coming back into the state. I think I saw a statistic that uh, by 2022, there should be 21,000 21, more manufacturing jobs in the state. And we've got to make sure that to keep those businesses, to keep those jobs here, we have people trained to be able to fill those jobs. Do you think there are enough training programs though? I think we're still working to, to make sure that there are. Uh, I think we can still, we can make it better. Okay. Um, where, where do you come down on the $15 minimum wage uh, and, the, uh, um, and the paid family leave legislation? Uh, Actually, the paid family, when I was chairman of the Labor Committee, we kind of came up with that concept at the time, so it's a long time in coming. I think it's important for families if we want to maintain families in this region. Uh, while people, you know, right now, they're allowed to take the time off to treat, to take care of a family member. 
Uh, but of course, a lot of people can't afford to take the time off. They need that. That's why they work, and they need that extra income. So we have to have a system. And I think the system that we were putting into play was basically where people paid into the system. And so it wasn't just a burden on the employer, so that it was something that would be available to them if they should find that they had to take name off. So I've, I've been uh, supportive of that for that reason. And the $15 minimum wage is, is we've worked in this state to uh, give, try to get people a living wage so that people can at least in some level support their family. Because uh, most of the people who are working at the type of jobs that are at those low wages are people trying to support a family. The arguments made it's just students, it's people looking for a second job, but in reality, more and more of those people are like single mothers or even fathers who are trying to raise a family, trying to um, support them so that they need some, at some level of a, a minimum wage that allows them to pay their bills. Um, you know, any um, caveats or adjustments for uh, those businesses that do depend perhaps on temporary and younger labor? We have a lot of you know, uh, tourism industry here it picks up with a lot of labor uh, in the summer. And then we've heard concerns and criticism that uh, they, they operate sometimes on tight margins and, and they have to stop paying that. Uh, it might mean hiring less people. It might be not opening. Kind of thoughts? Is there anything that I know when we, when I was like, again, going back to when I was chair of labor, we'd hear these arguments whenever we went to raise the minimum wage that, you know, there's going to be less jobs, we're going to be able to hire less people. And it never came to fruition. People were hired. They did what they had to do, uh, and it was never really the um, had the bad impact that we thought it was going to. That people said it was going it was it was going to happen. So it did in the end. They were able to work it out. I mean, and, and be able to pay those kind of wages. And I don't think this will be an immediate thing. I think it will be a gradual uh, easing up to the fifteen dollars, so that people can kind of adjust their business um, to be able to simulate that additional cost. Should it be uh, indexed to some inflationary measure or something so we don't have to have this sort of argument every time? I know. That, that comes up an <laughs> awful lot. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember the argument on why there, people are afraid to index it. I think they want people to sit down and really be able to talk about it rather than just make sure it ha so that it doesn't just automatically happen, though that would probably be a really good thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, how about on, uh, uh, on tolls? Uh, uh, you know, where do you stand? Uh, see them as a necessity to raise the revenue the state needs for transportation or what, what position well, do you take on that? Well, we, we talk about businesses in the state, and one of the things businesses in the state want is access to their businesses. They want the infrastructure available for trucks, for people to get to their, to get, first of all, for trucks to be able to get their products in, uh, to get their products out, to get the materials they need in. Uh, they also want to be able to have people be able to get to their businesses. So you need the infrastructure there, and that'll provide jobs for the region if, as we do this work. So um, nobody likes the idea of tolls, uh, but unfortunately to do any of this work, it's going to require some money. I think we've seen some suggestions that we at least toll the um, heavy trucks that we figure that they do the most damage to our roads. Uh, and it's some way, something comparable to what happened, what Rhode Island did is just being able to toll trucks that come in and out of the state. I know there's a court case for that, so we probably have to wait to see how that works its way out to see what we can actually do. And I, I know there's been a lot of confusion because there was some plan that had something like 86 toll stations across the state, but I think that was just uh, something that was thrown out there, but I don't think there's any final plan. I don't think we've gotten gotten that far into the process, mm -hmm. uh, but I think whatever we do do will be fair to everybody and won't probably be that egregious and that widespread, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Um, what do you have to say, uh, your opponent would argue to that, um, to the fact that if Connecticut were to just toll trucks coming in, that still the, the tolls would still end up on the backs of taxpayers because he's saying that companies bringing in goods would then make those goods more expensive to kind of balance out the tolls that they would have to be paying. Do you believe that that would be true, that Connecticut residents would, and in a way, like, even though it's diverted, mm -hmm. be paying for those tolls anyways? I, well, you pretty much have to pay a toll all around us to get into Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And again, I think if we had a better way of doing it, we wouldn't be looking at this. But the fact of the matter is our infrastructure needs a lot of work, and we have to have the resources to be able to... Mm -hmm. To, to, to improve it. So I think we have to look at something. And the fact that we have the lockbox amendment on the ballot this year ensures that that money will go to its intended purpose, which I think will make people more comfortable uh, if you're in a business that knows that it's going to an improvement that's going to help them in the long run. And how much is the state looking to gain from the polls, potential polls? 
Well, I think it depends on. I don't know if I've seen a number because it's um, because you know you do trucks. It's going to be one level. If you do trucks and cars, it'll be at another level. And I'm not sure I've really if I've seen a number, I've forgotten it. So I, I don't know. Okay. To be honest, mm -hmm. I, I want to say 50 million off the top of my head, but I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Okay. Maybe um, even actually, it's even more than that. I think it's in my huge pile of notes. I think <laughs> one billion um, a year. I think yeah, I think that's if you went widespread doing every everybody okay. and every vehicle. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, any thoughts on how we get to uh, some sort of fiscal stability in the state? You know, we had the uh, with the commission on fiscal stability, economic <laughs> growth, um, because we seem to be in this cycle of the legislature confronts these deficit projections and. and you know, has to work through that and try to bring the balance. The structural problems are uh, proving tougher. So, um, so your thoughts on what approaches have to be on the table, have to be looked at to, to try to close the deficit in one thing and try to restore some stability so that we can this uh, constantly. Right. Um, I think what, we, what we've already talked about is more jobs, so there's uh, more people paying uh, in income tax. Uh, it would be one way... To improve the as it improves the economy and help improve the state's well-being as well, I think uh, one of the couple of the other things we've been kind of looking at are um, the income that would come from sports gaming. Um, I think that's something we're talking about, and I think that's going to be coming. So that'll help improve the coffers of the state. That would help give us a little more sustainability. I think as we've looked at the budget, and I think you've seen a couple of the candidates, gubernatorial candidates, talk about the fact that really looking at the budget really carefully. I think we do that already, but again, you can always take a closer look to see what needs to be in there and what doesn't need to be in there. Uh, you know, even as we talk about regionalization for municipalities, that would come to a real to to some uh, sustainable output that we would put for cities and towns and, uh, and the educational system as well. So that concept of regionalization would probably, if we were able to do that more, would probably go a long way in helping us with some uh, long-term stability in the budget. Um, uh, what would be your response? You've been up there, uh, have a lot of experience up there. The, the, uh, the perception Republicans contend is, is uh, we're not it's not there's enough taxes we spend too much and uh, growth of government etc um, um, you know is that a, is that an accurate perception from your experience as far as uh, uh, that the revenues have, have uh, permitted too much growth in government and uh, the goal really should be trimming government well we have trimmed government I mean we've gone uh, we've cut I think about 12 to 13 percent of the um, uh, workforce for beginners and, and in fact to a point where people are now concerned because there might be some areas that we don't really have enough workers for example I was hearing that we have one electrician to work for DOT for this whole region so if you have an electrical problem there's just one person who's going to be able to take care of that so we have made the cutbacks and as I mentioned when we talked about the uh, the budget issues that we made a lot of cuts back then and when you cut services for people we get a lot of pushback because of that uh, we've seen some organizations, like the, in, er, in the areas of mental health, for example, that have had to consolidate uh, because we haven't been able to finance them or, or give them resources they need to perform some of their functions. So we've been making the cutbacks. We've been making the cuts that we need to make. Um, and I, I don't. And while Republicans, as you will, um, have been supportive of some of these real efforts, and I, and I think that's also one of the reasons we were able to come together on a bipartisan budget the last two years too, is we kind of have come closer together on those issues. Um, and um, if, when you guys agreed on that bipartisan budget, did you know? Did you know it would lead to the deficits uh, that we're facing now? I mean, was that uh, kind of baked in that uh, would have to do? Well, I mean, deficits are. are, are there's really no deficit until we do a budget. I mean, this is if we do the same kind of spending, do everything we've been doing, and we don't do everything. It's projected deficit. Right, right. If we do everything. Nothing changes. Exactly. Yeah. And we make changes so that that doesn't happen. Um, and this, and hopefully we're going to have, we have a surplus this year. That'll help us for next year. Uh, I think going into the next year's budget, and if, like some of these other things we've talked about, increased jobs in, uh, and some funding for maybe sports gaming, we'll probably be able to deal with that better. Uh, and there's a time in Connecticut did not have an income tax, and we have a, one of the candidates running for governor says mm -hmm. uh, he wants to uh, make uh, 
uh, Connecticut, uh, no income tax state once again. Mm -hmm. um, any, any thoughts on that uh, as a policy goal? Well, I, I kind of like his concept, um, and I think we already somewhat do it, of what's the term, zero budgeting, where you start zero from scratch. Budgeting. Zero exactly, exactly. Zero-based budgeting. And I, I think we do that to some extent, but I mean, really implementing that would probably be a good thought. And I think once he does that, he probably will realize some savings, but I don't think he'll realize $10 billion worth of savings in doing that. I think um, a lot of people in, in, will probably be hurt. I don't know we'd get the resources. Because one of the things we even able to do during the bad budget years was to keep the towns whole uh, for their municipal funding. Uh, which they appreciated and made you know helped us keep property taxes down, which is probably the biggest tax people in this state pay if they're a property owner. Uh, so the fact that uh, if we can give the towns help for education and their own needs, uh, we can keep the property tax down, which is important to most people. Getting rid of ten billion dollars from the state budget probably won't allow that to happen. So that would be that would be one of the concerns I would have. Plus a lot of the other programs that we have that people find necessary. Um, we've been asking everyone, or most everyone, uh, their, their position on uh, whether Connecticut should, should look at legalization of marijuana for adults 21 and older. I know you were an advocate on medical marijuana mm -hmm. and expanding it. You're at a case in point that you were talking about, but uh, uh, what about the step that other, some other states mm -hmm. have taken with actual you know, legalization of recreational marijuana? I think it's obviously, I, from if you look at the polls, people are really interested in having it. When they did it in Massachusetts, it, it went to the uh, the ballot box, and people made that decision that they wanted to do it there. I, I have some, some concerns here. I mean, while medical marijuana is uh, a legitimate use because it's been prescribed by a physician, recreational marijuana I'd be a little more cautious of, especially when we're in the middle of an opioid epidemic. There's a lot of conflicting information about whether marijuana is a gateway or not to that issue. Uh, I've heard one candidate, and, I, and this is something I probably would be willing to do, is saying, okay, whatever money we make from uh, legalizing marijuana for recreational use, that funding should go to help with the opioid epidemic to better address those issues financially. So that would be something I'd be kind of open to and be willing to listen to. But I think it's something we have to be cautious about as we approach that. I've been to, st like, I've been to Colorado and seen what it's done there. Um, they claim things, not really any problems there uh, because of it. Um, and it's a great industry there. They're, they're doing pretty well with it. It's really well regulated, as well as, as, our, as our medical marijuana industry is here. But there they really make a distinction between the medical marijuana and the recreational marijuana, taxing each accordingly. Um, and, and they claim that it's, it's uh, working well, the only issue being the fact that it's not uh, it's against federal law, and there's some issues with dealing with banks and stuff that they're kind of addressing as well. So, but you're not, you're not. I'm not totally not opposed to it. I'm not quite there yet. Okay. Okay. Is I guess is what I'm saying. Okay. If you want a direct answer, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. On that note, you um, you've been working to pass legislation to address the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about what you've done with that? With that? I think we were just we did a bill that really dealt with. Um, First of all, making sure that uh, I'm going to say the uh, an, the anti Nox Nox. Oh, why can't I think of the name now? Nox on. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Knock in. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it is available uh, because I mean we found that to be pretty effective in dealing with a lot of the folks who have overdosed on opioids. Um, I think we've also done a lot in the way of ensuring that uh, opioids are prescribed in a really responsible manner mm -hmm. uh, by limiting the amount of uh, pills and now people have to be, uh, I think the doctors have to keep a registry of not who they register to but how much they have put out there so that people can really keep track of how uh, many opioids are out that they're being used responsibly. Um, we've also seen, um, I was just, just looking at this this morning about some of the, th the other things we did during the last session, um, oh, registering any opioid um, uh, uh, overdoses so that we can the Department of uh, Public Health can keep a better track of what's going on. So those are some of the things we've done, just keeping it better. And then doing a study, really looking at a, finding the funding and the resources to do a major study on what we can do better to deal address the issue. So those are some of the things we've done. So those have passed or? Those That's those what we did this last session pretty okay. much, yeah. So you haven't been able to really see the effects yet and it's, right. it's, it's making a difference at this point. Right, right. I know I've had some people who are concerned um, 
because they rely on opioids, but we're even looking at ways that, and I think you see a lot of the people in the medical profession looking at better drugs that might be able to replace opioids so they don't have to use it. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's been some talk about using some variations of marijuana to help address some of the um, issues that opioids are currently addressing and see if that can happen as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something we're still going to look at carefully. Uh, your district spreads across three towns, I think? Yes. <laughs> Uh, one of them being Norwich, uh, uh, like other urban centers, uh, they've been concerned about the impact of, uh, of nonprofits uh, tend to cluster into the urban centers, and and uh, obviously they, they, can't, they can't be taxed, and the state provides payment of taxes mm -hmm. to make up for that, but it, but it hasn't been funded really up to the level that uh, legislation would have called for. So, you know, any thoughts, you know, going into another session about concerns like places like Norwich and New London uh, and, and, and that burden they face uh, with the nonprofit and tax for property? Right. I, I think we, we have to make more of an effort to fully fund, not well, to better fund, I should say. I don't know if we'll ever fully fund the pilot money. Uh, we kind of come up with some of these other proposals that kind of go around it, but I think actually take resources like for uh, away from the pilot funding where they think towns would benefit if we just put that money toward the pilot funding that would give them, uh, help them with some of the issues they have. I have to admit, knowledge has been uh, pretty receptive uh, and been a great host community for a lot of these agencies. Um, in fact, there was even talk of trying to move the DCF office from downtown and they really made a push to make sure it stays downtown because it is close to a lot of the services the people who use uh, the services of DCF uh, would have would have and would have, be able to have better access to rather than make them travel all across the town. So knowledge has um, been receptive in that regard, but I, I know realize that they need some financial help to be able to um, do what they need to do and to pay their bills with these facilities uh, downtown. Um, should there be, should we revisit what kind of nonprofit is exempted from taxation or uh, potentially look at other ways of fees that might be, be assessed uh, to provide for the police coverage via the fire protection because you know mm -hmm. these big hospital systems for example I mean you know they're not this kind of orphanages and small hospital mm -hmm. networks that were once they're, they're almost corporate in their, in their reach and size and, and, and resources they have um, I mean we don't have any huge facilities like that right now and I think actually I think the tax collector and knowledge did something like that yeah. um, kind of was a little more careful in how she gave nonprofit status to some and uh, it, it caused some concerns but they had to address you know how much of our function is done for public good and how much is done for raising revenue for example and uh, she made them really address that issue so they so they have at least at the local level start looking at that I guess I kind of have like an overarching question like it's very clear that you're very well versed in state issues um, and you're working to address those but how would you say that you're really making sure that your own constituents are being heard at this uh, on the state level well we get out quite a bit I, I go to a lot of functions in the, in the, in the three towns uh, so people can uh, come in contact with me get to know me and if they don't have something to talk to me about to me about then uh, that they will be comfortable enough that they know that they know they can call either me at home or, my, or at my office. But a lot of people will come up to me and talk when they see me. They might never call me, but once they see me somewhere, will come up and bring up an issue uh, because I'm right there. And uh, we kind of just being out in the public allows that to happen. And like I said, if, even if not, then at least they have some comfort level that they know they can call me when a problem does arise. I'm pretty good at about getting back to them. What Thanks. issues are you hearing? It's, it's really um, across the gamut. I mean, we've had folks who've had just different difficult problems with some of the social service agencies you're talking about being able to get services. Uh, some of the issues, they come to me even though it's a federal issue and we have to redirect them. Um, I had somebody for the first time in a long time, it's kind of funny you just mentioned this, uh, dealing with emissions. I, I hadn't heard anybody complain about emissions for a while. But that came up this week too, so uh, which is which was a little different. Mm -hmm. So we kind of worked with that person and actually came to a good resolution with that too. Mm -hmm. And we've had folks who have you know who are foster families who, again, are having some issues with DCF. I mean that happens every once in a while. 
Uh, we work through that because uh, you know we have families that have been kind enough to be able to bring other people into their home, and they've grown an attachment and want to be uh, take care of that person as best of a person's as best they can. And sometimes they don't always see eye to eye between the agency and themselves. So we have to see how they can better work out their their problems. Mm-hmm. So so it rain, ro- runs the gamut, quite honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're finishing up our half hour. Anything you wanted to add or we're going to cover or the closing, you know, closing comments? Well, I think, you know, I think I have a, a long record of giving great service, great service, good, great service, I'm going to say great service, to uh, the, the 139th District, and I'd like to be able to continue to do that. Uh, I think I have a record of being, like you talked about, reaching out to people, listening to their concerns, and addressing it in the legislature, even either in the chamber itself when we vote on bills or on a personal level when we look, deal with constituent services. All right, well, thank you for coming in. Thank you.